Thank you. All right, wonderful. So uh, today I've agreed to give a talk on developmental dysplasia of the hip, and um, the, uh, it, nothing amazing will come out of this. And most of you have heard a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say, and and I think uh, the main point of it is that despite everything that we know, and despite the fact that we all know it, uh, people still have uh, some problems and uh, we still have cases that kind of slip through and, and or develop late. Um, and so I just have to disclose that I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon and a member of a couple of committees um, and, and that's about it. So the, the objectives of this uh, uh, talk today are to describe in, uh, the clinical and radiographic findings associated with the uh, DDH and to describe the management approaches and indications for each of those to treat developmental dysplasia and to describe the risk factors and natural history of uh, uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip. I'm having a hard time with this chat box, keeping it out of the way. Okay. All right, so by definition, a, a, a developmental dysplasia of the hip is a hip joint that is unstable. That is to say, you can take it out of joint and put it all right, from in the joint and take it out of the joint. It is subluxated at, at rest or is dislocated at rest. And this can be manifested at birth or it can be manifested later after say three months or six months or even a year. Generally speaking, if your hip is well located at a year, it is unlikely to uh, dislocate later unless you have some other kind of problem, such as uh, Down syndrome or some other uh, uh, disease process or syndrome that lends itself to ligamentous laxity. So there uh, is some epidemiology associated with this. Um, it's uh, pretty uncommon in African-Americans, but it's uh, very common in Laplanders as well as Native Americans. Uh, family history is uh, very important. And any time you see a child with a with a uh, chance that they have a, a developmental dysplasia of the hip, you want to ask about family history. Many of them have a family history of such a problem. The main risk factors or the biggest risk factors uh, are what's going on while you're in utero. The most important of which is breech presentation. So breech positioning uh, places the hip in, in such a position that it is uh, extremely uh, uh, flexed and um, in, in such a position where the, uh, the, the femoral head is not sitting well seated in the acetabulum and it can lead to a uh, situation where the, uh, the acetabulum doesn't have a chance to develop normally. Myelomeningocele can also uh, contribute to this, although probably more to do with the neurologic nature of the, the myelo and certainly if you have a, an L1 or L2 or even sometimes an L3 myelo, uh, you can have a dislocated hip associated with that. A firstborn child is also a risk factor, although that's less of a risk factor than uh, than uh, breech positioning. Uh, certainly female uh, sex is also a, uh, a particular um, uh, risk factor. And then uh, finally, oligohydramnios. If you have a decreased uh, uh, amount of fluid and, and you're really packed in tight, uh, then you're going to have a higher risk of uh, having uh, DDH associated with that. There are extra uterine uh, risk factors as well. Uh, these can be uh, ligamentous laxity, uh, as I described with the Down syndrome. It can also be uh, just having a little bit of acetabular dysplasia to begin with. And then finally, how you uh, swaddle your child is also a, a risk factor. Um, the one thing that I, I tell every parent who I see with DDH, no matter how, no matter the severity or what's going on with it, is that they need to let the hips flex and abduct when they uh, swaddle their child. Uh, the the uh, uh, families that um, try to swaddle their child with the hips extended and abducted have a much higher risk of, of worsening the DDH or actually uh, creating a little bit of DDH. Finally, what's the, the natural history? The, the natural history of, of developmental dysplasia of the hip is, is actually not awful. Um, they, uh, in the sense that there's not necessarily a lot of pain with it. Uh, they, uh, if it goes undetected and they make it into childhood uh, as you know, two or three years old or, or even a little bit older, uh, 
they can present with a painless limp. Uh, this could be a, a Trendelenburg uh, type limp or unilateral toe walking. They can certainly have some stiffness in their hip, especially with abduction. And they'll have a decreased speed and endurance secondary to the, uh, the dislocation. Eventually, uh, they can develop an, uh, arthritis as adults. If, if it's not recognized or the family just says, uh, we don't believe in surgery, don't touch us ever, then that, uh, that patient uh, can continue to function quite well, uh, although it depends on whether they uh, form a false acetabulum or not. If they do have a false acetabulum, then there can certainly be a certain amount of arthritis and pain associated with that. But if they don't, uh, then they're uh, able to walk around and participate in society as a uh, without a significant disability and um, just have the uh, uh, just the the decreased endurance speed and and Trendelenburg gait associated with that. That is not to say that those uh, outcomes are acceptable. Uh, it's just to say that um, while we try to avoid this, sometimes the outcome is not as bad as all that. I'm sure the hip surgeons on the line would totally disagree with me, but I'm just trying to take the long view here. So uh, with respect to diagnosis, uh, the this is one of those diseases where or problems where it's much better to identify the problem early um, because it's much easier to take care of early. It's the same with uh, septic arthritis and it's the same with uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis. If you can find and identify those subtle signs and symptoms and risk factors and uh, keep an eye on things and then treat uh, early, uh, it's you're generally very successful and you're much less likely to have any long-term problems associated with that. The very, uh, the gold standard uh, for diagnosing uh, de developmental dysplasia of the hip is the physical exam. The physical exam starts with an inspection you want to look to see if they're uh, asymmetric thigh folds. Personally, I don't think the thigh fold uh, exam is terribly sensitive or terribly specific, but it's talked about all the time and you can see it um, at times. I think the specificity of it though is, is quite troublesome. Now, certainly the Galeazzi sign is, is quite important. And this is with one leg being uh, shorter than the other when you have the, the hips flexed. Um, and you definitely need to uh, to always look for that. And the, the very the most important thing with that is to make sure that the that the pelvis is level while you do that. You also want to check uh, abduction inflection. Now this is not taught in the books uh, as well, or it's not highlighted in the books as much as some of the other parts of the exam, like uh, the Ortolani and Barlow test. But it is very important, especially in those kids who are older than than. Uh, say four months or six months when you're no longer going to uh, be able to dislocate or or relocate a uh, hip uh, because the ligamentous laxity has uh, disappeared. So you want to check for abduction inflection uh, on every patient with this problem. And then finally, you do want to do the Ortolani and Barlow tests, and we will look at those in just a second here. All right, so this is the uh, a demonstration of the Galeazzi sign. And the important thing to see is that the pelvis is level here. So you wanna make sure, and the way I do that is to put my hand over the top of the uh, the pelvis and put my finger and thumb on the ASIS and then using my own proprioception, figure out that the pelvis is level and then flex the knees and, and then take a look at uh, to see when if one's uh, you know longer than the other. Now, it's not really a case that the femur is shorter on the affected side, it's just that the femoral head is dislocated, no longer located in the acetabulum. And so it's a relative shortening, not a true shortening. So if, at if, what uh, age? Oh, go ahead. At what, at, sorry, I was just wondering, at what age does the Galeazzi become most sensitive? It seems like really early, maybe it's less sensitive. Yeah, I was just going to, that's a great question, Andrea. And uh, certainly uh, you have to have a high degree of suspicion at a young age. You have to you have to actually want to find it because it can be just as subtle as say five millimeters or, or a centimeter. And and certainly when the kid is older, when the femoral heads are bigger, that, that will be more like two centimeters or even three centimeters and a little bit more obvious. Um, but I think you have to take it in the context of the entire uh, examination and, and certainly once you get past the six month point, I think the sensitivity 
is is reasonable. And I have one patient story to tell at the end that will uh, demonstrate that a little bit as well. I don't have an exact number if that's what you were asking for. All right, so the Barlow test or the Barlow sign is when the hip is located and then you are able to dislocate it because of ligamentous laxity and, and acetabular dysplasia. And the way to start this is with the, the hips slightly abducted and the pelvis level, and then you place your hand as demonstrated here on the screen with your uh, uh, thumb on the inner aspect of the thigh and your uh, fingers on the, uh, the greater trochanter. And then as you uh, adduct the, the leg and you do a little gentle uh, axial load going uh, from the knee to the hip, it will then slide out. Now, interestingly enough, this never makes a sound. When this is positive, you never hear a sound associated with it. So, so it's not a click, it's actually more of a, what we call a clunk associated with it. And, and it's actually less of a sound and more of just a sensation or a feeling in the hand as you feel the hip slide out. Another important thing to realize, because every mom watching you do this is gonna say you're hurting my child, is to realize that you are not hurting the child when you do this. They may be crying, and in fact, it's very important that the child not be crying when you do this. It's they, it, For this to work, they, they need to have a certain amount of relaxation. Otherwise, the, the muscles will just stay tight and it will be hard to uh, get that sensation. Likewise, with the Ortolani test, you start with the hip a little bit more adducted with your thumb on the inner aspect of the thigh and your fingers on the, uh, the greater troke. And, and this is very important to have your fingers on the troke for this. And with them relaxed, you abduct the, uh, the, the hip and then slightly lift forward and feel if you can feel the hip uh, sliding back into place. So it's very important when you're doing these examinations, the Galeazzi and the Ortolani and the Barlow, as well as even the, the abduction, uh, for to have a relaxed baby uh, you can give them a bottle or you can give them a binky, just something to get them to, to be not screaming while you're trying to do this. And then uh, make sure that the pelvis level. And then finally, and this is where I'm you know, very proud of, of our pediatricians in, in the United States, you always have to have an increased index of suspicion. Uh, one, that makes you actually do the exam. And two, uh, if, you're, if you're just kind of going through the motions, it's very easy to just slide right over this. You have to actually uh, you know, be a little zen about it and just kind of focus on what you're doing for about, you know, a minute and, uh, and or even 30 seconds and you can figure out if something's going on or not. And the reason I, uh, it's difficult is because those those signs and findings, while while they're very important, are pretty rare. They don't happen a lot. And in fact, when I see them in the office, I frequently walk down to the uh, the clinic uh, that's next to me where all the, the pediatricians and, uh, and residents are and ask them to come down to take a look at it because I tell them this is, you know, this is going to be the second or third time you see this in your residency and that's going to be it. So you need to, uh, to take a feel of this. Of course, the orthopedic resident has to do that as well. So what about the hip click? So the hip clicks are uh, just, uh, you know, there's actually an ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes for hip clicks. But the hip click by itself is is not uh, indicative or uh, of any pathology, nor is it necessarily associated with anything, uh, and it's certainly not pathognomonic for a hip dysplasia. So if you hear a click with the hip movement, it's usually associated with a tendon sliding over bony prominence. Sometimes that can be the uh, tensor fascia lata or the uh, psoas tendon, uh, and sometimes when they think it's a hip click, it's actually a click coming from the knee uh, rather than the hip. Uh, I think a hip click in an otherwise uh, risk-free uh, child is not necessarily an indication uh, for an ultrasound if you have no other physical signs or symptoms associated with hip dysplasia. Any questions about uh, the physical examination associated with uh, DDH? Great. All right. So. Um, certainly, if you have a uh, breach presentation or uh, physical exams, uh, findings associated with uh, uh, DDH or suggestive of DDH and ultrasound uh, before six months of age is indicated.
So the ultrasound is used to assess, uh, assess the depth of the, uh, the acetabulum, as well as the, uh, the angle that the, the uh, acetabular roof makes with the, uh, the ilium. Now, the, uh, I was forwarded some uh, OID questions, which I don't have in the, uh, the presentation here, but one of them I would have gotten wrong because for me, the alpha angle is associated with the depth of the acetabulum, uh, but they said it was the, uh, the, the sorcial uh, angle that makes with the, uh, the, the acetabulum or with the, the ilium. But uh, I think those both sort of refer more or less to the same thing in my mind. Regardless, the alpha angle is, to me, the most important uh, piece of information that we get from the ultrasound. Uh, that's the first thing that I look at, and I pretty much ignore the beta angle. Um, the beta angle, for me, does not provide any particular information, nor is it controlling information. I don't uh, say, well, everything is else is okay, but the beta angle is wrong, so we're going to do this. Um, likewise, uh, less controlling as well, or less useful is the the amount of uh, uncoverage of the femoral head with uh, adduction or with the stress view. So uh, while that is information that we get every time with the dynamic assessment, uh, it is secondary to uh, what the alpha angle is. So this is a picture of a ultrasound here and the alpha angle is made uh, with a line drawn along the ilium and then uh, down into the, uh, the, the acetabulum here. And normal is considered anything above 60 degrees as normal. Uh, the beta angle is sort of the, uh, uh, the angle with, actually, I'm gonna skip that. I can't even tell you why they have the beta angle there. So this is a stress view. Uh, on, the, uh, on the left, we have a hip that is located and then they did an adduction and uh, axial pressure, and it demonstrates that the hip is really quite uh, subluxated. And this, I would consider sort of an ultrasound of a beta uh, of a Barlow positive hip. Um, and you can see that uh, with this second image here on the uh, the, uh, the the right hand side, that the alpha angle is really quite small. It's probably around 45 degrees or so. So that would be considered uh, severely dysplastic is almost certainly not the same pelvis because uh, this alpha angle here on the, uh, the left is a little quite uh, much closer to normal or more than 60 degrees. So there is, uh, for completeness sake, there is a classification system associated with the ultrasound. This was developed by the, the champion of ultrasound in Germany. His name was Graf. Uh, he's come up uh, with this uh, quite elaborate uh, classification system, which is based on uh, a number of uh, different criteria, uh, the most important of which is the uh, um, uh, the alpha angle right here, and uh, and and then some other aspects where the bony rim is uh, sharp or blunted or rounded, and what the cartilage, what the femoral head is uh, coverage is, and and also the age of the patient. Now the uh, interobserver and interobserver. Uh, um, uh, stability of this uh, classification is is quite limited and I do not typically use this and when people speak to me in graph I don't understand and I ask them to tell me what the patient's age and alpha angle is and then go from there so there's a question of whether ultrasound screening is uh, for all children is uh, worthwhile now in, in Europe, it is considered worthwhile. They have decided that they're going to look for it everywhere. Uh, they have subsequently done studies that have not demonstrated that, uh, that they've caught all the DDH that develops. Um, and, and that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, in that you have to continue to have a suspicion for developmental dysplasia of the hip because it can develop after birth and it can develop as a uh, uh, infant um, uh, so you always have to sort of keep it in mind and having a normal ultrasound uh, or a nearly normal ultrasound uh, at age, say, two months is not protective against the development of DDH later. Uh, furthermore, it, it has poor specificity as well, uh, leading to a certain amount of overtreatment and, um, and it has been established that it is not cost effective. Uh, despite this, it is common for uh, ultrasound screening of all newborns in Europe and not at all common in this country. On the other hand, 
Uh, with respect to breach presentation, this is considered a sort of rather hard indication for an ultrasound at six weeks, even if the exam is normal. Certainly sooner if the exam is abnormal, if they have a uh, Ortolani or Barlow positive hip. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have an abnormal exam or an abnormal ultrasound and you're initiating treatment or you're just keeping an eye on things, then serial exams are uh, common and indicated. Uh, what I have not written down here is that I typically uh, usually wait four to eight weeks uh, between ultrasounds. Uh, I, I'll do two weeks if they're Ortolani positive and I've placed them into a pavlik harness. Uh, otherwise, if I have them in a pavlik harness just because they're Barlow positive, then I will go four weeks. Uh, and, and if it's uh, just sort of a, on the edge of uh, normal or just moderately uh, dysplastic rather than severely dysplastic, uh, then I will uh, wait two months uh, between ultrasound. So at some point, plain radiography becomes the, uh, the imaging of choice. Uh, some people do this as early as four months. I typically like to wait until I can see the uh, femoral head. Uh, and, and then generally that's at six or seven months, um, a little bit later in uh, females than males. Um, and the main reason I go from ultrasound to radiography is because the femoral head, when it's ossified, actually blocks the, uh, the assessment of the uh, uh, um, acetabulum by the ultrasound. So once the femoral head is ossified, I typically start getting plain radiographs. And there's a number of different things that you want to look at um, uh, on the plain radiograph. One is you want to establish what the acetabular index is. You want to look for Shenton's line and whether it's disrupted or not. You want to evaluate the presence or absence of the teardrop. And you want to establish whether there's delay in the ossification of the head or and whether the femoral head is poorly covered. So this is how we uh, evaluate the acetabular index. So this horizontal line here is called Hilgenreiner's line. And the, the way you make Hilgenreiner's line is to uh, find the point that's uh, on the uh, superior side of the triradiate cartilage and uh, but lowest down and uh, place your marker there and then come across to the same point on the other side and that establishes Hilgenreiner's line. So the, uh, the other line you make is by drawing a, uh, a line from the, uh, that point where Hilgenreiner's line touches the triradiate cartilage over to the outer edge of the, the acetabulum. So you can see here on the right uh, that the uh, uh, index is 22 degrees and then on the, uh, um, the left-hand side is 40 degrees. I'm not sure if you can see it on the imaging that you have on your computer, but you can see like there's a little bit of a space here. And in fact, if I had drawn this line, I probably would have gone a little bit higher even just to, to kind of get into that space because that's sort of a better representation of uh, and more reproducible for me anyway on where you should draw the line. Now, the acetabular index changes over time. And this is uh, really important because uh, there, there's a certain indication at which point you would say, okay, we need to uh, definitely operate on, on this. Um, and typically, uh, you think about operating on acetabular dysplasia when the acetabular index is above 30 and it remains above 30. Now, um, you can see here for uh, boys and girls that the acetabular index continues to decrease in time uh, from age, especially from uh, when they start taking x-rays at six to nine months uh, down to three and four years of age. So typically, if I have a hip that is located, and uh, but they have acetabular dysplasia, I will uh, typically see them over a, you know, from the age one through age three and a half or four, and to follow what's going on with the acetabular index. And if it's not dropping, or if it's remaining well above 30 degrees, uh, that's when we start having a discussion about whether proceeding with a, a acetabular um, osteotomy is appropriate or not. Uh, the changes with the uh, acetabular uh, index also happen uh, with uh, if you have a dislocated hip and you relocate it, uh, 
then your acetabular index will continue to improve. I mean, that's part of the reason for relocating is so that your your acetabulum is uh, it has a chance to get better. And so you can see here on the blue line where they took a hip that was dysplastic and dislocated and relocated it, that over the first six months or so, and then over you know the following two years, the uh, the acetabular index has uh, rapidly improved and and nearly caught up uh, to the uh, the normal side. Any questions about acetabular index at all? All right, I will continue to talk at my screen. So Shenton's line is uh, the line that's drawn on the uh, the underside of the pubic ramus here and the inner side of the uh, the proximal femoral neck. And you can see on the right side that it is intact. You're able to sort of see a circle underneath here. And sometimes with the, the radiologist, they'll actually draw a circle and, and leave it there so you can see that Shenton's line is intact. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side here that it is not intact and, uh, and that it's broken. And so you can't actually draw that sort of imaginary line uh, across the uh, uh, ischial ramus uh, from one to the other. And so this is a really obvious one. This is an example of delayed ossification. You can see that the uh, on the right-hand side here, which is normal, that the, uh, uh, the femoral head is delay uh, forming quite nicely, and that on the other side here, it is quite delayed, although it is there. And in your mind's eye, you could kind of see like the shape of the, uh, the, the femoral head, um, but you can see that it is dysplastic, and um, uh, as well as the, the break in Shenton's line, although it's not terribly elevated, is certainly uh, laterally translated and subluxated. Any questions on the, uh, di uh, the, the imaging of uh, hips in children and uh, toddlers? All right, very good. So there are a number of treatments associated or are indicated for uh, varying aspects of uh, uh, developmental dysplasia of the hip. Uh, one certainly is bracing. This can be a pavlic harness or it can be an abduction brace. Uh, in certain circumstances, a closed reduction is indicated. Uh, other times when uh, the, the, the child is older and the hip is uh, dislocated, an open reduction is indicated. And in rare circumstances, um, say they have a, a, a very dysplastic hip or it's quite elevated or it's syndromic, a femoral osteotomy uh, is indicated. Or perhaps if the child is really old, maybe they're four or five years old before they finally presented. Um, then a femoral shortening osteotomy is indicated. And finally, pelvic osteotomies are indicated if they have uh, a severe uh, uh, acetabular dysplasia or, or their acetabular dysplasia is not uh, resolving with uh, the hip located over time. Uh, so this is the picture from the, uh, the packaging on the pavlic harness, uh, and, and, and it's put on there so that you know, so that moms are happy about having their child in a pavlic harness. It never works, uh, but they, they try to be happy about it. And, um, and pavlic harnesses are indicated for infants who are zero to six months old. Uh, generally past that age, it's not uh, terribly effective. The, um, typically, I place the uh, pavlic harness at about 90 to 95 degrees of uh, flexion. And, and one thing that's important uh, to realize is that when you're looking at the baby on the outside, you say, okay, well, this is about 90 degrees. But if you were to take an X-ray of this baby with the pelvic harness in this position, the actual flexion at the hip would be less than 90 degrees. So it would be more like uh, 85 or 80 degrees. And, and so that's not enough. So on the outside, I think that it's safe and reasonable to flex it to 90, uh, 95 to 100 degrees on the outside. So a little bit of extra flexion is okay. Now, if you go past that, you can certainly develop uh, a problem. And, and um, the, the main problem or a, is uh, the development of a, uh, a femoral nerve palsy. Uh, this is transitory, and, and I've not read that necessarily it is ever permanent, uh, but it's certainly scary to the family when their kid stops kicking their leg. Uh, 
Um, and so it's certainly something to uh, perhaps mention. Um, uh, the other thing to realize too, is if they do develop a femoral nerve palsy, then they're pretty, uh, pretty high likelihood of failing uh, the use of the pavlic harness. And, and it's really just an indication to uh, discontinue use. Um, generally, typically when I indicate a pavlic harness, it is for uh, kids who have a Barlow positive uh, hip and definitely for those with an Ortolani positive hip. Now, if I have a, uh, for some reason, if I have a newborn in my clinic uh, who does not have a huge number of uh, risk factors, they weren't breech, uh, they're the third child, there's no family history, um, and they come in at two weeks with a slight Barlow positive, then I might have that child come back uh, at a month or maybe three weeks later and re-examine them. And if they're still Barlow positive, then you're still well within your uh, uh, reasonable timing as far as a placement of a pavlic harness. Um, so uh, that is to say that sometimes in those situations, very early on, uh, the, uh, the, the, the instability that you've detected with the Barlow exam is spurious and the ligaments will tighten up uh, with time and that the hip will remain located. Um, on the other hand, if the family doesn't show up, you better call them and drag them back in uh, because you kind of let them go. Um, certainly with a, a, a Ortolani positive uh, hip at any time, a pavlic harness is indicated. With an Ortolani positive hip, I usually keep them in or have the family keep the pavlic harness on 25 hours a day, eight days a week for the first two weeks. I, I pretty much ask them not to take it off at home and, and then get a, an ultrasound at two weeks. Uh, we want to make sure with the Ortolani positive one that, that we're not developing a fal false acetabulum and, and developing a, what's called pavlic harness disease. If the hip is located at that second uh, ultrasound, then we can continue uh, with the ultrasound and uh, can transition to maybe 23 and a half hours a day for the next month or six weeks, and then finally to half time use. With a Barlow positive hip, I generally do full time for a month. And then if they're stable on re-examination and their ultrasound is demonstrating an improved uh, alpha angle, then we um, uh, go down to say another two weeks of full time and then transition to half time use. It's very important to make sure that their astabular, or I'm sorry, that their alpha angle is improving and their exam is improving as well. So the main benefit of the uh, pavlic harness is to avoid needing to do a closed reduction or open reduction. It also helps if the hip is dislocated to keep the femoral head located, which then allows for the ligaments to tighten up and, and allows for better development of the, uh, the acetabulum. The risks associated with it are fast, uh, false acetabulum development, femoral nerve palsy, and uh, the biggest risk is that uh, families will not use it and then refuse to come back to see you and go to see a chiropractor instead. I tell them that that's a mistake, but sometimes they don't believe me. All right, so any questions about pavlic harness? While I take a sip of coffee. All right, so a pavlic harness is uh, usable from say uh, zero months to six months. And after that, then we uh, typically uh, uh, go to an abduction brace. Now the indications for an abduction brace are a little bit more um, uh, controversial or less, uh, uh, less proven in the literature. Uh, we usually can use it in the younger kid, less than six months if they're failing pavlic harness treatment. It tends to keep their hips less flexed and they're less likely uh, to develop a, a false acetabulum with it. <clears throat> and it can be sort of a sort of a second effort to avoid a closed reduction in those uh, failed pavlic harnesses in the young babies. Um, it certainly can be used if they have severe acetabular dysplasia, the hip is located, uh, but they have severe acetabular dysplasia and you're trying to come up with something uh, to uh, help that go away other than an uh, iliac uh, osteotomy. So sometimes we can uh, use an abduction brace for that. And it can be used in kids who can walk. You can see in these little pictures here, whoops, go back, that uh, the kids are standing and they can certainly stand and walk uh, with these uh, 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 braces on. So um, uh, let's see, we also use these after, after doing surgery, whether that's closed reduction or an open reduction. Uh, if they get closed or open reduction, as I'll say later, they're in a cast for three months. After they come out of the cast, then we put them into the abduction brace. 
We typically do that full time for three to six months and then half time for another three to six months. So, uh, and that's, that's it for the abduction brace. So indications for closed reduction. This is when you have failed uh, pavlic harness treatment and you failed abduction uh, harness treatment and their, their hip is dislocated, it's not riding too high. Um, and and you want it, and you think that you know if you can get it in, that it will stay there. Uh, this is generally a reasonable choice or a reasonable thing to talk about with parents between six and eighteen months of age. You could perhaps do it a little bit earlier than that, uh, but I typically wait until they're six months old. Uh, this is indicated if the hip is dislocated. If the hip's not dislocated, then uh, the hip doesn't need to be reduced. Um, and then yeah, those are the the main indications right there. So the technique is to to reduce the hip under anesthesia, and then you test the ability, uh, the stability of it, and assess the safety zone. The safety zone is that area between. And I have a picture of it um, uh, between, say, uh, full abduction minus 20 degrees, and when the hip dislocates with the hip flexed at 90 degrees. Um, to increase the size of your safety zone, to increase that maximum abduction, uh, you can consider a percutaneous adductor tenotomy. And then you can certainly evaluate your reduction with an arthrogram as well. Once the uh, the hip is reduced, you place them in a spica cast with the hip in abduction, flexion, and internal rotation. It's usually one of the ugliest uh, uh, spica casts you see because it's not like that that really nice uh, Captain Morgan uh, spica cast you get with a femur fracture. Their hip is much more flexed and and somewhat more abducted as well, and and it's kind of a really bulky cast. Um, you typically cannot make this a unilateral cast because you want to control that sort of hip motion. So you do have to go down to the other leg. And then you almost, it's its a standard of care at this point to check a post-reduction MRI or CT scan. We generally try to do this uh, at the time of surgery um, with the uh, the IMRI that we have now, or the, uh, actually we have an MRI in on the seventh floor uh, with the sedation unit. And sometimes we go down there. But it is okay to check it after the kiddo is awake, um, either that same day or within a week or two. We generally change the uh, the spica cast at six weeks, uh, and they're in the spica cast for uh, three months total. So this is an example uh, or a diagram of the safe zone. So at 25 degrees on this one, the hip dislocates and uh, the maximum abduction, surprisingly, is 90 degrees. This must have been after an adductor tenotomy. And so you take that 20, 25 degrees off, and, and so then the area of safety is between the uh, 35 and uh, six degree, 60 degrees of uh, abduction. So you do do an arthrogram. This is with a 50-50 mix of the dye and the saline. I typically use a spinal needle because it's you know, longer. Um, and uh, uh, this can be either done through an anterior or a medial approach. We use fluoroscopic guidance for this. Uh, one way to, once your needle is in the right place, then you can move the hip just a little bit, kind of wiggle the leg, and, and you can feel the, the, the needle scratch the, uh, the surface of the femoral neck, and then you pretty much know you're in the right place and can inject a little bit of uh, dye in there. Uh, it's been described to do an error arthrogram beforehand, but I typically uh, would, uh, don't do this and would not recommend it. Uh, just go straight with the dye and, and just do a little bit because if you're not in the right place, it'll certainly go somewhere that's not useful. And if you do a lot right off the bat, then then you might obscure the, the details that you're looking for. So on this uh, image here, you can see that the hip is very well located. They're you know, on the medial side and all the way around, there's just this very thin line of dye and it's given us a nice picture of the, the femoral head here. You can see that the labrum extends out beyond the, the femoral head here and that the, it is not inverted. Um, and there's no medial dye pool here. There's no uh, a sense of a, an hourglass, which would be coming from the psoas tendon kind of uh, draped across the, uh, the joints and attaching to the, uh, the, the lesser troke. On the other hand, this image here shows that the hip is not located, the, the joints way over here, and, and you can see that the, the, there's less dye in this area from here to here, and this is kind of what they call an hourglass uh, arthrogram. And, and part of this is because the, 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 the psoas tendon is so tight across this area and the, the 
capsule of the hip is so tight that it can't allow the femoral head into the acetabulum. So you want to assess your reduction uh, after doing a closed reduction. If it's stable and located without extreme adduction and or flexion. Um, certainly you don't want to have any di medial dipole or inverted labrum. And if you need to, you can consider doing a mini medial open reduction. And this can be done sort of stepwise. Uh, you can certainly do your adductor tenotomy percutaneously, uh, but if it's still unstable or you're still kind of tight and having a hard time getting the, uh, the, um, uh, the hip located, then you can do sort of the um, uh, small medial uh, approach and identify the psoas tendon as it's attaching to the, the uh, lesser troch and, and release it at that point. And frequently in a younger child, less than uh, say 12 or 14 months old, that will allow the, the hip to then relocate or locate into the, uh, the hip joint. If it's still tight, and, and you're still having problems getting, getting it to sit nicely, or if you have a, a large medial dye pool, then it may be necessary to go ahead and, and release the, the capsule as well, um, which can be readily identified once you've released the, the psoas, you can uh, lift, it, lift it up and it's right there, um, and or uh, release the, uh, the transverse ligament after releasing the medial capsule. You cannot do a capsulorophy from the medial side uh, but you, at this point, you've basically uh, converted your closed reduction into a medial open reduction. Um, I've had some success with this when necessary, but once again, it's uh, the, the the number of cases showing up with uh, DDH requiring closed reduction is pretty small, and so then making these steps is uh, once again another is exponentially less common. All right, so the spica cast, the, uh, I tell every parent that uh, spica cast is an unfair test of parenting. Um, and, and it takes, you know, twice, you need to change the baby twice as often as you would normally, you need to use two diapers. And so when I say double diapering here, it's not like double diapering for, uh, uh, for trying to treat a mild abduct, uh, uh, hip dysplasia. It's, it's because you want a diaper on the inside and a diaper on the outside to try to keep the cast as clean as possible. And you have two casts for six, six weeks each. At that, at that cast change, that's done under anesthesia as well. And if you want to, you can do an arthrogram at that time. Usually it's, uh, for me, I find it sufficient just to do an examination under anesthesia and use the, uh, the um, C-arm to identify the position of the femoral head. Uh, the other thing too, is you can definitely take some of that flexion and abduction away that you had for the initial cast and put them in a, a slightly better station. So the results with uh, closed reduction are, are really quite good. Uh, Sankar and, and the International Hip Dysplasia uh, Consortium uh, gathered up a whole bunch of cases from a bunch of different air places. And, uh, and they had 91% initial success with the closed reduction. And of these uh, that they were initially successful with, 91% remained located. 25% did develop AVN. And that's that seems like a lot. Now, most of the time, most of that AVN is probably mild. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the study didn't go out far enough to say if there was any significant um, abnormalities to, uh, that developed from the AVN. If you are going to get AVN in your hip, it's sort of like having Perthes disease at a very young age. And as I'm sure you're aware, getting Perthes at age four is much better than getting it at age eight or 10. And, and the chance to remodel with a, with a moderate or mild AVN is, is really quite good. And the mean acetabular index at the end uh, of the study was 25 degrees, and that means that most of their kids did not need to have to undergo an acetabular uh, operation. So the uh, uh, open reduction is indicated when the kiddo is 12 to 60 months old with a hip dislocation. Uh, usually you should uh, or always include an adductor and psoas uh, release. The psoas release uh, if you're doing an anterior reduction is, is done as it goes over the uh, rim of the acetabulum and you, uh, you can lift the, uh, the psoas and you have to get at the tendon on the underneath side. Uh, you, you need to definitely be careful of the ephemeral nerve uh, when you do this. And if you're you know, really going for it, you can actually injure the, the femoral artery um, if you've really gone very medial. This, uh, you may need to do uh, femoral and or uh, acetabular osteotomies. Um, and I'll go over that in just a second. 
The approaches uh, that are anterior or medial, the anterior approach is much more typical and allows for you to see everything uh, much more easily uh, that you're addressing. You're, you can address the, the uh, patulous uh, capsule. You can address the, um, uh, the ligamentum teres much more easily. Uh, you can do a capsulorophy when you do an anterior approach, um, and uh, you can easily identify the, or more or less easily identify the, the transverse ligament at the, uh, at the base of the uh, um, acetabulum as well. And all of these things need to be released uh, to allow for the, the hip to sit um, located. Medial approaches can be done, and uh, there's uh, multiple ways to get through the uh, the, the initial layer of muscles to get to the psoas and then and then to the uh, the capsule and the uh, transverse ligament. So we can do osteotomies for this as well. Femoral osteotomy is indicated if you have a really high dislocation or if they're older, uh, say they're three or four or five years old. Uh, certainly this can be indicated if they have syndromic dysplasia, such as um, you know, cerebral palsy or uh, some other kind of syndrome. Uh, the The main the main reason for doing this is, uh, no, there's two. One is to decrease the uh, pressure on the femoral head if it's uh, very high, um, or if they have severe coxa valga associated with the uh, their acetabular dysplasia, then it, you can certainly uh, give them a little bit of varus and derotate the, uh, the femur as well. Acetabular osteotomy, uh, excuse me, acetabular osteotomies are indicated if they have severe acetabular dysplasia and they're older, there's less time for remodeling. They have syndromic dysplasia, it's frequently necessary. There are different types for younger children, and I'm not gonna go into deep, deep detail. I'm already 45 minutes into this. Uh, so there's the Salter, which allows, uh, where you cut the uh, ilium all the way into the uh, uh, sciatic notch. Um, and then there's the Pemberton and Dega, where you do an incomplete cut and, um, and are able to close the, uh, the acetabulum a fair bit. The thing with the Salter is it does require the uh, the placement of pins. And what's nice about the Pemberton and Dega is you typically don't need to place pins and then you don't need to do surgery later to take them out. So um, the, uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, kindly developed an appropriate use criteria for the, uh, the treatment of uh, DDH between the zero and six months. And this was uh, recently updated in 2018 there was one developed for uh, PCPs and there was one developed for orthopedists as well. I would encourage you to go take a look at this. It's a very uh, interesting uh, item to, uh, to use and it can help guide your treatment. There were 40, uh, uh, there was a large writing panel, say uh, 10 uh, doctors and, and pediatricians and uh, based on a number of different uh, characteristics, such as their age, physical examination finding, the presence or absence of risk factors, what their ultrasound looked like if they had one, and what their x-ray looked like if they had one. Uh, and then they voted on those 432 scenarios and uh, came up with, um, you know, and then assigned a treatment. They looked at each of these treatments for each of those scenarios and, and said, okay, this is appropriate, this is maybe appropriate, or this is not likely appropriate. So the grades of recommendation were appropriate with agreement, may be appropriate and rarely appropriate. We can see this on uh, ortho guidelines uh, and the website is right here. I'm going to back out of this and see if I can't pull it up on my browser here. Ah. All right, so this is the front page of the uh, ortho guidelines and it says double diapering is not effective and skilled and quality ultrasound evaluation should be available. Um, for me, that means I'm not doing the ultrasounds. I like to have people who do ultrasounds all day long doing the ultrasounds, not me. Um, there may be people who are in private practice who may consider doing that, but I would encourage you, if you're taking care of kids with DDH, to let the professionals do it. Uh, they do have a special statement on breach presentation. They say that if they have, a, if they have breach presentation, they strongly recommend uh, doing a screening ultrasound at six weeks and a screening radiograph at six months. So let's go to the thing here. And so this is the uh, uh, the site and you can put in the findings that you have. So say you have a kiddo who is uh, between zero and four weeks of age, they have uh, risk factors associated with that. 
breach presentation. Uh, they have they have a subluxatable hip on exam, and they've not had an ultrasound yet, and they've not had a radiograph. And then you put it in there, and they suggest an abduction orthosis. With a and then when you do an abduction orthosis, then they recommend getting the uh, uh, the ultrasound again. Uh, they they said you could uh, wait. Again, so this is where maybe you could do that uh, after, say, two to four weeks. And you can see, like, my personal preference is maybe to do that unless they were breaching, breach, in which case then I would. Um, and then surgical intervention right off the bat is not indicated. So that is a very useful uh, tool, and I would recommend highly taking a look at that, especially if your neighbors come to you and ask you about their child with DDH. I have two questions. Here, it's Andrea here. I got you there. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so my first question was, it's kind of weird, but I was just curious with that abduction brace, you know, it's really flexed through the hips. And so if it's in a child who's starting to walk, I'm just curious, it seems like they would have to arch their back quite a bit to kind of be upright. Have there ever been kind of increased spondylolisthesis from extension like for you know if you're doing six months of treatment or is it usually a shorter course and that's ridiculous and such a little being so the um i've not heard of any uh spondylolisthesis as being a problem i think that uh or spondylolysis for that matter um the i think that the the brace is flexible it has a hinge um at the in the center of it that allows the the brace to kind of you know move a little bit, which is what allows them to walk. Um, so so I don't think, and when I've seen them wearing it, there's there's a little bit of increased lordosis, you know, so uh, to make up for the the position of the, the flexion in their hips, but but not enough to cause issues that I'm aware of. Gotcha. And then my other question was kind of the the tweeners, like the in between. I don't know if if Hoffman Kagan are are uh, on this. I think they are, but um, you know, I could spend half of my clinic day seeing women in their 40s with borderline, you know, hip dysplasia, you know, with basically an almost normal center edge angle, usually like 27, but an upsloping tonus, and they have, you know, pretty moderate arthritis, and they're crying, you know, because they can't run anymore because of their hip cartilage disease, and and we explained to them it's because they have borderline hip dysplasia, they're developing arthritis early and it's likely they're gonna need hip replacement, you know, within the next decade. And we can start to see that really in the late 30s. So I guess my question is kind of whether, you know, the criteria um, is falling short of, um, of being able to recognize a more subtle in-between population that is also at risk? Yeah, that's um, a, a excellent question. And I guess there's two, two ways I think about that. One is that uh, the population that you end up seeing with this problem is probably um, quite narrow. You know, you're kind of at the bottom of the funnel, if you will. And, and so, so it, it's probably, you know, I, the, the real question is what is the actual prevalence of, of that problem when, you know, or the, the incidence, if you have a very mild hip dysplasia, what is, what is your actual risk of developing something? And so we see all the people who complain about it and, and uh, use and abuse their hips and, and maybe they were cheerleaders or did a bunch of gymnastics and, and they're all kind of antiverted and so they have labral problems and, you know, should we do anything about that? And, and I would suggest that that since we don't know what the true uh, uh, incidence rate of having problems at a fairly young age, like 40 or 50, um, that it makes it difficult to then kind of turn around and say, well, if we uh, identify, say, every kid who has acetabular index of more than, say, 28, and we should operate on all those, I, I think that we'd end up doing a whole bunch of operations to you know, maybe avoid one problem out of 10 or 20. And, mm -hmm. and it would be almost impossible to try to figure out what the number needed to treat was to, to avoid a problem in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, the treatment is, you know, becomes invasive, invasive quickly. So, you know, it's not like you can do a Pavlik in, in somebody older, do screening in early adolescence and capture those that are, you know, kind of looking worse over time or something and have something low risk to offer them. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's such a big, and that kind of harkens back to that old saying, you know, we, we measure with a micrometer and cut with an ax. And uh, and doing a astabular uh, osteotomy is certainly an axe-like operation, and and it's hard enough to uh, talk a family into to doing it when you know because their kid is is pain-free at age four, and and to try to get them to do the operation just based on the fact that the astabular index is 35 instead of the other side being 22. I mean, they can see that, but it's still kind of a reach. And and to to kind of choose to do that when they're even closer together and and convince a family that, yeah, this is going to help them down the line, uh, it would be even more difficult, I think. What other questions do we have? I, I, I guess I filled up my entire hour, um, but I'm happy to continue to chat. Uh, if there are any questions from the residents or any of the other staff. Well, I appreciate this uh, this opportunity, and um, I'm sure most of you would like to get to uh, the operating room and get working. So um, certainly, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, discuss something that I enjoy to uh, treat. Take care.